right show active speaker uh okay uh, i'll start with the introduction uh, welcome everyone to the online ai seminar series this is our second virtual ai seminar of the semester we are very pleased to have cynthia rojan uh, with us cynthia is a professor of computer science electrical and computer engineering and statistical science at duke university Previously, she has held positions at MIT, Columbia, and NYU. Uh, she is a three-time winner of Inform's Innovative Application Analytics Award. She's top 40 under 40. Uh, she was named as one of the 12 most impressive professors at MIT in 2015. She has served on a lot of committees like Inform's, National Academies, uh, American Statistical Association, DARPA, AAAI. She's a fellow of both American Statistical Association and Institute of Mathematical Statistics. Currently, she's a, a Thomas Langford lecturer at Duke University. Uh, we are very pleased to have her, and today she's going to talk about do simpler models exist and how can we find them? Uh, Cynthia, all yours. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm sorry to be there in person, but hopefully, this will. The, I work in learning lean more and more toward like more complicated models and even in cases when they're completely unnecessary and so I didn't want to just give a talk that says stop using black box models because that's really not constructive right that's more destructive so I wanted to give you I wanted to tell you not just don't use you know don't use black box models but I wanted to tell you why you don't need them okay so I'll give you um, an example of recidivism prediction in the criminal justice system. So they use predictive models to determine people's risk of being arrested in order to determine whether to release someone on, on bail or parole or for social services. And in some cases, these models are so complicated that it's easy to compute the predictions incorrectly. So um, this is a New York Times article, and it's about a case where uh, a typographical error in the input to a predictive model it led to years of extra prison time for somebody. And the typo was in his criminal history features. And he didn't realize that there was a typo there until after he compared his score sheet to someone else's score sheet and was like, oh, there's something wrong here. And um, the, um, the model that the justice system was using for this prediction was called Compass. And, um, you know, you'd think these models like Compass would be really accurate, right? Given that they use potentially over 100 features, but they aren't. Um, so we, we um, did an experiment with some data from Florida that um, to test the accuracy of this particular black box model Compass. By the way, Compass is used very widely across the justice system. And here's what we found. So we, what we did was we took Compass, which is this, again, black box model, and we compared the accuracy of scores from the black box model with scores created by our latest machine learning method at the time, which was called Corals. And Corals is basically, it's just called, you know, certifiably optimal rule list, and it's an optimal decision tree method. And it just computes um, sparse, accurate trees. And so we took this data from Florida, and we, we took, we got the compass scores, and we, com we compared them with what our algorithm would produce. And what the algorithm produced was actually so small that we could fit the whole machine learning model on the bottom of the slide. So um, this is the machine learning model that Corals produced. It said, if you're 19 to 20 years old and you're male, predict that you'll be arrested within two years of when your compass score is computed. Also, if you're, if you're 21 or 22 years old and you have two to three prior offenses, then predict arrest within two years, again, from your compass score computation. Also, if you have more than three priors, predict arrest, also predict no arrest. So it's this tiny little model that you wouldn't, you know, you're looking, you'd look at it and think, well, I don't think that could be that accurate, but the truth is that, um, that they're about equally accurate. Okay, so uh, what I'm showing you here is um, tenfold cross-validation accuracy. Um, the different colors are from the different folds, and corals produced essentially the same model across all the folds, which is the model I showed you on the previous slide. And the accuracies are basically the same for, you know, compass and corals throughout, you know, no matter which fold you're on. Um, and not only do these two 
models perform the same, it doesn't actually matter which machine learning method you use, they all perform relatively similarly. Um, and these models range from like real black boxes, like, you know, well, Compass is a black box because it's proprietary, but also we have boosted decision trees and support vector machines with radial basis function kernels and random forests, and they produce very complicated models that don't fit on a slide. And then if you look, if, you know, if you're comparing it to something like corals, where the whole model is, you know, on the bottom of the slide right there. Okay, so now there was this huge debate over algorithmic fairness of Compass, but the truth is that we don't actually seem to need Compass at all. So why are we still using it? And I just want to go back to my point here. So, um, you know, there doesn't seem to be any benefit from complicated models for rearrest prediction and criminal justice. There's many papers on many different data sets that kind of indicate the same thing. Um, but it seems to be true that there's no benefit from complicated models for lots of problems. And I'm just going to put a list of problems up here that I've worked on. I've, you know, I've worked on a bunch of different problems. And for none of them did we need a complicated model. But it depends on your data set. Like neural networks, they're really great for computer vision. Neural networks are really great when you need to like create a good data representation, like, you know, like for computer vision or um, for time series like speech or something like that. But if your data naturally come with a good representation, like in all of these problems, then all the algorithms tend to perform the same. Okay, so then why are we using complicated models? Um, well, there's some really good reasons. Um, first, you know, it's much easier to make a profit from a complicated model, but also um, they're much easier to it's much easier to construct a complicated model than a, than a simpler model. Um, so, you know, complicated models are it, it's kind of ironic, right? That complicated models are easier to construct and that simpler models can be very, very hard to find. So let me just give you a bit more detail about that. Um, let's say we're doing supervised learning where we wanna minimize a loss to make our models accurate. But now if you also want it to be simple, um, then you have to constrain the optimization problem to force the complexity of your model to be small. And so then you get to constrained optimization and depending on the constraints, the problem becomes much harder. Okay, so um, for instance, if you're doing decision tree learning uh, and you just wanna get a low loss, then you could use CART or C4.5, which greedily, you know, creates the tree greedily from the top down and produces some big tree that gets you a low loss. But if you want to get that same loss or better with like a sparser model, then, you know, that's exponentially more work essentially to get it. And as a preview of what's coming later, uh, the algorithm that created this sparse tree that's more accurate than Cart's tree, um, the model ghost here that created the sparse tree. Um, that is something that we're currently working on and it computes certifiably optimal sparse decision, binary split decision trees. Okay, so if the problem on the left is about finding an accurate decision tree, then that's much easier than finding an accurate and sparse decision tree with the same, you know, with the same accuracy. You just want it also to be sparse, right? That's much harder. Um, so if the problem on the left is to find like an accurate linear model, um, then that's much easier. Like you could just use logistic regression for that. Um, but if you want to find a model that's really sparse, um, well, that's much harder. Um, then what about if you just like, you know, okay, you just unleash the, the most complexity we have at the problem, um, like, you know, boost a decision tree model or a neural network. Now, the question that I want to ask today is, can you get the same accuracy with maybe like an accurate or, and sparse decision tree or an accurate and sparse linear model? When, when, does, when did these simpler models from these simpler classes get to the accuracy of the, of the neural networks? Right? So that's the kind of question I want to I want to answer. I want to know when are these things equal in practice? Uh, you know, am I going to get the solution to this problem, you know, an equally good solution, um, without you know without actually solving it? Like, can can I determine whether these things are equal, whether the constrained loss is going to get me, or the yeah, whether I can get a you know constrained solution that has as good 
of a loss as the unconstrained solution. And I don't want to actually solve the constrained solution, right? Um, because this is much more difficult. I would rather know that these things are likely to be equal to each other before I try to solve this constrained problem, right? Can I, can I know that a simpler model exists before I find one? Okay. So um, yeah, so can I determine the existence of a simple accurate model with before I find one without actually finding one? Okay, so um, what I'm gonna do in this talk is I will define a condition under which a simple yet accurate model is likely to exist. And I'm going to um, show you the work we're doing on computationally efficient solutions to some of these hard optimization problems. And in particular, I'm just gonna talk about decision trees. And then I said um, I wanted to find a condition under which a simple yet accurate model is likely to exist. And that condition is that the Rashomon set is large. And I'll tell you what that means. OK. So um, the Rashomon set, the true Rashomon set, I'm going to define to be the set of models with low true loss. OK, so if I write down the expected loss, just plain old supervised learning. Um, the true Rashomon set is the set of models with low true loss. Okay, and of course you can't compute the true Rashomon set, but that's how I'm going to define it. Okay, so the set of models that perform well with respect to the full distribution from which the data is drawn IID. Okay, and then, yeah, so this is the Rashomon set there. It's the set of functions that have low true loss, and there's a parameter theta. It's part of the definition. Okay, so I claim that if the true Rashomon set is large, then a simple yet accurate model is likely to exist. Okay, so this is kind of like a like a big fish theory, right? Like like the idea is, uh, um, you know, we're with a, a big ocean theory. The, if the ocean's really big, the higher the chances that you'll find a big fish, right? And and the larger the Rashomon set is, the larger the chance that you could find a simple function in there somewhere. Right, there's so many good models. There, there's so many, yeah, there's so many good models that hopefully at least one of them is simple. Okay, that's the idea. Okay, so I'm just gonna change my notation um, slightly. Uh, instead of expected loss, I'm just gonna write L just to make the notation simpler. So L is expected loss. Um, and so the Rashomon set, the true Rashomon set is the set of functions that have low true loss. And um, I drew, by the way, in the last slide, I, I've been using like these really nice smooth um, loss functions with one minimum. But the truth is that the Rashomon set could be disjoint and it could be you know, discrete. Um, so it, it could be really anything. And it, it depends on your loss function. If the loss function is discrete, like for decision trees, then um, your Rashomon set is just a set of trees. OK, so I want to show you the simplest possible abstract setting that we could think of that um, where where the thing on the bottom could happen. So I'm going to try to formalize this statement here in the bottom for a particular setting. Okay, so I'm going to start with a finite hypothesis space. So just the set of simple models, which is called F1. And then I have F2, which is all models. And then simple models is inside the set of all models. And F1 is uniformly drawn from F2 without replacement. Okay, so that's my, I'm defining F1 to be uniformly drawn from this finite set F2 without replacement. And I, I know that it's abstract, and I know that simple models aren't randomly drawn from a more complicated function class. I know that. But in reality, as long as each complex model is reasonably close to a simple model, then the same idea is going to work. Okay, so um, now I'm going to define F2 star. And that's the best possible model if you know everything. Like if you have access to the true distribution that the data are drawn from, and if you have access to the full function class, like the more complex class, then this is the model you'd want. Okay, that's the best possible model. And then um, F1 hat, on the other hand, this is the best possible model that you could produce, right? If you had just the simpler function class and then you just had data. Right, so you only have access to the training set and you're restricting yourself to work with the simpler models. And so that's what you can get and this is the best that you could hope for. 
Okay, so I'm just simplifying notation. So again, expected loss is L, empirical loss is L hat. And what I want is uh, that the, true, the best true risk of the complex class, so the loss of F2 star, I want that to be close to the best empirical risk of the simpler class, which is L hat of F1 hat. So I'm just gonna write that down. So I want, I want to know, you know how good F2 star can be if I know everything. So F2 star on the test set compared to F1 hat on the training set. Okay, and this bound is going to involve um, what's called the Rashomon ratio. Okay, and the Rashomon ratio is the fraction of models that are good. So um, let me just... Uh, show you that. Okay, so the Rashomon ratio is the fraction of models in the complex class that are good, okay, that have low true loss. Okay, so I'll show you this bound. Okay, I just put all the notation from the previous slide up on the top so that in case you forget, you can just look there. Okay, so the theorem goes like this. It says for any epsilon greater than zero with probability with high probability with respect to the random draw of data of functions, um, random draw, sorry, random draw of data, but also random draw of functions from F2 to form F1. Then I get that the, the best possible true risk, like the true risk on the test set, is not that far away from the best empirical risk on the training set with the limited class of functions. And then this is the bound, but there's some stuff I haven't told you yet. I haven't told you what this probability P is yet. I, have, I said with high probability, but I haven't told you what that is. Um, and so what, what I wanna point out here is, um, there, I'm gonna put that up. So the probability P is, is right there, and it depends on the Rashomon ratio. Okay, so um, these two things, the bound on these two things depends on a few things. It depends on the size of the simpler function class, not the more complex function class. The more complex function class ends up here in the Rashomon ratio. Okay, so the Rashomon ratio is here. So if the Rashomon ratio is large, well, this is negative, and then that's negative. And so the probability is higher, okay? So if the Rashomon ratio is larger, then with higher probability, I get that this bound holds. So the Rashomon ratio really helps me out. Okay, and so, so you, you kind of get the best of both worlds here. Like you get that the best simple model on the training set isn't too far from the, you know, isn't, isn't too much worse than the best possible model you could get on the test set. And the bound is nice and tight. It depends on the, you know, the complexity of the simpler class and also on this ratio, the, the sort of size of the set of good models. And the probability here is a little bit inscrutable, but I can give some examples because the bound is um, it's actually amenable to, to actually giving you examples, which is kind of cool. Okay, so for example, if your function class consists of 100,000 models and at least 1% of them are good, right, that have low true loss, then the bound holds with 99% probability when you have at least 526 simple models. So it's, it's pretty, you know, it's, it's not that bad, right? Because you, all, you, all you need is 526 simple models. And as long as 1% of the models in the class are good, then, then you're good. And then here's another example. So if, again, if your function class consists of 100,000 models and the Rashomon ratio is, is only like half a percent, like just half a percent are good, then the bound still holds with 99% probability as long as you have like 1,051 simple models. And it only gets better when you have more than 1,001, 1,051 simple models. Okay. So what the bound says is that if the Rashomon ratio is sufficiently large, so if you have a large fraction of models that are good, then with high probability, the best, the best empirical risk over the simpler class F1 is close to the best true risk over the larger class F2. And the generalization guarantee comes from F1, size of, the size of the simpler set. Okay, and then I've mentioned that this whole, the, the most unrealistic thing here is the fact that F1 is a random draw from F2. But um, 
you know, and in reality, simple models wouldn't be just a random draw from a complex model class. So we've been actually working on a number of bounds that replace this random draw assumption with smoothness assumptions on the set. And then you actually can get simple models being more smooth or have certain properties to them. For example, like maybe, um, you know, we also, we also have um, assumptions that the Rashomon set contains a large ball and some parameterized function space. So as long as um, one of these assumptions is true, you get a bound that has this flavor to it. So I wanted to show you this bound in particular because it gives you the flavor of the, the other bounds in the paper that I don't really want to get into. Okay, so these results and the other theorems um, that are in the paper suggest that as long as our simpler class is a good approximating set for the more complicated class, and if the Rashomon set is large, you know, if there's a lot of good models, then we might as well work with the simpler class. So for instance, if decision trees approximate neural networks, and for my problem, if the Rashomon set is large, then I don't need to work with neural networks. I can just work with decision trees because I'm not going to lose any accuracy. Okay, so the Rashomon ratio, you, you might be wondering, like, this are, these are learning theory bounds. How does the Rashomon ratio compare with, like, BC dimension or some of the other complexity measures? Well, um, large Rashomon ratios pertain to the existence, the existence of models with good generalization. They were not doing standard learning theory. The Rashomon ratio, it doesn't work the same way that standard learning theory results work. Like, for instance, um, you know, the Rashomon ratio is not the same as the geometric margin that's, that's used in support vector machines, right? So because, in, in, because the, the margin, the geometric margin, is measured with respect to one model, whereas the Rashomon ratio is measured with respect to many models. Like, the, I'm showing you the margin over on the right, and then the Rashomon ratio looks at all of these different good models, and the, the, the fraction of models that are good. And then it's not the VC dimension because the VC dimension is data independent, whereas the Rashomon ratio is a property of a loss function on a data set. It's not algorithmic stability. Algorithmic stability is a property of an algorithm. The Rashomon ratio is a property of a loss function on a data set. And it's not Rademacher complexity. Um, you know, it's uh, Rademacher complexity measures the ability to fit noisy targets, whereas we're using fixed labels. And it's not the same thing as a flat minimum, which has gotten popular lately in the theory community, because here we don't need uh, one minimum. It could be many local minima, and we can even work with spaces that are discrete. So, so far, um, our theory says that large Rashomon sets allow us to use simpler functions without losing any accuracy. Um, so what happens in practice so normally you can't actually measure the Rashomon, the size of the Rashomon set because it requires you to look at the whole model class. You have to look at like the whole class of functions, which of course is usually impractical, but um, we're gonna do it anyway. Um, so we're gonna um, compute the empirical Rashomon ratio, which is the fraction of models that are good empirically. Okay, so um, you know, normally you wouldn't, there's no reason for you to ever have to calculate this in reality because you know it's a lot of work, but um, I'm going to I'm going to do it today. Okay, um, of course, don't try this at home. <laughs> but what we found was pretty interesting. And as you as we found out, you don't actually have to calculate the Rashomon ratio in reality to gain practical insights from it. Okay, so we did this experiment where we calculated the size of the empirical Rashomon set using decision trees of depth seven. So why did we, you know, why did we use decision trees of depth seven? Um, so depth seven has some, uh, it's like it's like big enough for us to fit the data pretty well, but it, it doesn't allow us to overfit. And also we could sample from the set of decision trees. You can actually randomly generate decision trees. So we can sample from that set really nicely. Okay, yeah, decision trees can be sampled. They're a good approximate. Oh, they're also a good approximating set for a larger function space because they're able to fit our data sets. So we figured that you could you could approximate support vector machines and other sorts of stuff pretty well with decision trees. Okay, so I want you to, so separately, I want you to think of a function space that's big enough that it includes, uh, you know, trees, support vector machines, boosted decision trees, forests. So just a whole bunch of models from different classes, but that don't overfit. So I, I want a function 
set that encompasses like lots of models that you might consider using, uh, but that don't overfit. So I'm defining essentially F1 and F2 from my theory. Okay, so, um, and then, um, I want us to think about approximately covering that set with decision trees of depth seven. Okay, so this is the simpler function class, again, the decision trees of depth seven, and then the more complex function classes coming from boosting and support definitions and so on. Okay. So, and then what we're gonna do is look at the performance of many popular machine learning methods on the data set. Now, um, we're also gonna measure the size of the Rashomon set because um, if the Rashomon set, here, yeah, so, and we're gonna evaluate, do all these methods perform similarly? Because um, if the, um, if all the methods perform similarly, that means they're all living in the same Rashomon set, right? It means that, um, you know, the, if the Rashomon set's big, it means that it can accommodate lots of diverse functions from different algorithms. So if the methods perform similarly when there's a large Rashomon set, then our theory is right on track, right? If, if, and we can calculate the Rashomon set from the decision trees of depth seven. So if we find that, that decision, large Rashomon sets of decision, of decision trees of depth seven correlate with all of these methods performing similarly, then um, that says something about um, our theory, whether it's correct, okay, if, they, if these two things correlate with each other. Okay, and then we're also looking at whether the models generalize if there's a diverse Rashomon set. So I'm gonna just tell you the, um, the results of the experiment, which is that when the Ra Rashomon ratio is large, all the methods tend to perform similarly and generalize. And um, the reverse, interestingly, wasn't always true. And that wasn't expected um, by our theory, but we have a simple explanation for why that might be happening. So let me show you the result. Okay, so we used 64 data sets, um, classification data sets, regression data sets, synthetic data sets, all different numbers of features, all different numbers of classes. And what we found was that when there's a large Rashomon ratio, we end up with results like this. So this is uh, five different algorithms. Um, this is four different data sets. And the Rashomon ratios here are large. I know 10 to the negative 37 is, doesn't seem large, but it's actually large. And these were, I'm leaving out some details here on the important sampling to getting these numbers here. But what we found essentially is that when the Rashomon ratio is large, all the methods perform the same. They all tend to generalize. And then for small Rashomon ratios, um, we didn't always find that to be true. Um, sometimes the methods had different performance and sometimes they didn't generalize as well. But sometimes, like I said, um, our theory didn't quite capture it. Like sometimes you'd find, even though we measured a small Rashomon ratio, um, then everything would still generalize. And we think that this has to do with the way we're measuring the size of the Rashomon set. Like we think that it can appear artificially um, small if there are some extra features in the data set that don't do anything. And um, as it turns out, if you have extra features in the data set, then the denominator of the Rashomon ratio becomes artificially inflated. And then we have, um, and then, and we have, we have like in the paper, we have some explanation on exactly how this works. And we have some ideas on how to avoid that when you're measuring this Rashomon ratio. But for now, these are the results of the experiments that we have. Okay, so then we, again, <laughs> come back to this point that you can't actually measure the Rashomon ratio in practice. But that's okay because we actually get a lot of information about these experiments. Um, so uh, if the Rashomon ratio is large, then all the methods tend to perform similarly and they generalize well. Um, and if the methods perform differently, it's likely to have a small Rashomon ratio. So, um, yeah, so we're not, you know, we're not completely sure about all this. But it's certainly a viable, possible explanation for what's actually going on in practice. Okay, so we, we found something else besides the results that I just showed you, which um, well, I'm plotting something called the, what we call the Rashomon curve. And we weren't expecting to see this, but we found it on every single data set that we worked with. And I'm gonna show you a cartoon of it. It's, it's a plot of the Rashomon ratio versus the empirical risk. And let's say you take a hierarchy of function spaces, like decision trees of depth one through one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, or something like that. And um, 
these are nested, of course. And so what happens, um, what happens on this plot if you, if you do this? Like if you go from simpler classes to more complex classes, right? What, what happens? Well, um, well, you would expect the empirical risk to go down, right? Because your function classes are getting more complicated. So your empirical risk goes down. And then what happens to the Rashomon ratio? Well, um, there are more and more good models as you increase complexity. But the denominator of the Rashomon ratio, which is the total number of models, increases very quickly. So actually, instead of going up, this, this, thing, um, this thing goes down. Okay? So the, the fraction of models that are good actually decreases. So um, you're expecting to see something that goes kind of diagonally downward. But what we found was something that looks like this. So we found that um, as you start with the simpler function classes, you can tend to reduce empirical risk by not really changing the Rashomon ratio too much. But then at some point, there's this like steep drop off, it like nose dives, and the Rashomon ratio gets really tiny as these function spaces get bigger and bigger. And you might get a little overfitting, like you might see it go kind of diagonally this way. But in reality, this nose dives so quickly that, um, that you don't even see it most of the time. So, uh, and, and there's always some kind of elbow, some kind of like turning point in these things. Um, and you might not see the whole curve, right? You might, you might just see part of it. And um, like, so you, you could see like things like this, or, or you could see kind of just one part of it. Um, and we've seen this, these curves on every single data set that we've experimented with, and it just always looks kind of like that. Um, so I talked to you about the training set, but what, do you, what would you expect to see on the test set? Um, well, the test set is a lot easier because standard learning theory tells you what happens on the test set, right? Standard learning theory tells you that we should, not, we should generalize better for simpler function classes and we should start overfitting for more complex function classes and that's simple. Okay, so, and, and so what this theory is telling us, what, the, you know, what these curves are telling us, and, and learning theory, and standard learning theory, they're telling us that this elbow is actually kind of important, because that's where you're going to see the best test performance, right? So test performance is at the end of these arrows, and then as you start overfitting, it'll kind of go like that, right? So that's what theory tells us. Um, and so what, what I can... And what I can do is kind of show you all the experiments. Um, now I didn't, I wasn't sure whether to try to put 64 data sets on like one slide or multiple slides, but I ended up just trying to put it all on one slide. So you, you can kind of see like that you, you really do see these curves kind of everywhere. And sometimes the theory works beautifully and sometimes it doesn't, you know, so it depends on, on, on the randomness. Um, well, I'll, I'll zoom into it in a minute, but my point is that these Rashomon curves exist on every single data set that we've seen. Okay, so I'm gonna zoom into some of the curves to show you the generalization. Okay, so um, yeah, so sometimes the theory is insightful where you really do see overfitting as you kind of go down these curves. Like here, the, the elbow is the best over here. And here the elbow is the best over there, and then you start seeing overfitting. Um, but sometimes uh, we always generalize, and then in that case, um, you know, all of these models are equally good um, on the, the vertical part. And sometimes you never generalize, and that just happens. Like if you just don't have enough data, you just never generalize, and so there you're getting, you're seeing overfitting throughout. Um, but the interesting thing is that no matter which of these three cases happens the elbow model is really not a bad choice, right? So if, if, you're, if you're actually gonna use this for um, you know, model selection, then you kind of wanna get to where this elbow actually is because that seems to be a, a good choice, right? You wanna increase complexity just until you hit that elbow and then um, you wanna stop because you could be um, overfitting. Okay, so that, brings me to the question of when you do a real experiment, where are you on this curve? Um, so as I mentioned, in reality, when you do an experiment, you don't have the whole curve. You just get part of the curve. The part, you just land on whatever part of it you're doing the experiment on, right? 
Um, so you might want to try to figure out where you are in the Rashomon curve in order to determine whether you're whether we're up above or below the elbow. And remember, we usually can't measure any point on this curve. Okay, so uh, because you can't measure the Rashomon ratio. So if you're in this part of the curve, then the best model uh, for each of the different complexity levels has the same performance, right? Um, so like if you, um, uh, sorry, has different performance, different performance, so sorry, empirical risk. So if you run like logistic regression, which might give you a simpler model versus a neural network, um, you're going to get different performance and adding complexity is actually decreasing your empirical risk. Um, so that's how you could kind of figure out that you're in this part of the curve. You just run a whole bunch of algorithms and you can say, oh, they're all giving me different performance. I need to increase complexity. Um, and then if you're on this part of the curve, then all the methods seem to kind of perform the same. And then in that case, you might want to try to go upward and get simpler models um, because your neural network's actually not getting you any more accuracy than your logistic regression model. Okay, and so I had been thinking that that this kind of uh, this kind of way of thinking about the problem um, might explain some of the things that me and other people have been observing across problems and across data, right? There are some problems like ImageNet, where um, you know designing more and more complicated models, you know, is really helping. <laughs> um, and that's actually reducing error and that's getting you like closer to the elbow on this side um, and adding adding complexity actually helps but if you consider problems like mnist where um no matter which method you use you get 100 percent accuracy and in that case maybe we should be aiming for simpler models like lower like you know where sorry higher rashomon ratios simpler models simpler model classes so we can get toward the elbow toward the elbows um, and then, you know, if you get simpler models on MNIST, they might generalize better outside of MNIST. And then there's a ton of problems of the kind that I usually work on. So I usually end up working on problems like this, like credit scoring and stroke prediction and recidivism prediction and those kinds of problems where you can never really get high accuracy. Like no matter how much complexity you throw at the problem, you're just not getting any more accuracy than, you know, in some cases, what, 74%. Um, and so adding more complexity, it just isn't going to help you. You're not going to get higher accuracy. Um, what you're better off doing is finding models that are simpler um, and that can get you, um, yeah, finding models that are simpler that can get you that level of accuracy that all the other methods can get. Okay, so um, yeah, so that's my sort of perspective on, on the field. Um, so. What I've gotten to is a simple check for the possible presence of a simpler, simpler yet accurate model that doesn't involve computing Rashomon ratios that can just give you some general advice, right? So you could try picking several of your favorite machine learning methods and you run them all in the data. And ideally these machine learning methods would produce models of different levels of complexity. Um, and then if they all perform differently, your model class might be too small to include the elbow solution. So in that case, you might want to broaden your horizon by using a more complex model class to see if you can gain more accuracy. And then if, you, um, if all the models perform similarly, then your model class might be larger than necessary. And this is the check that a lot of people forget to do. They just, um, you know, they, they just say, oh, I'm just going to launch the most powerful thing I have at the problem, and, um, and I'm just going to run with that because it's fairly accurate. So in that case, um, what you might want to do is, um, if they all perform the same, you know, delve in, find specific models with, with specific properties like interpretability, um, or you could um, look up by, you know, improving your generalization with, without reducing accuracy by moving toward the elbow and decreasing complexity. So I, I like this analysis because you're actually benefiting from knowing the size of the Rashomon set without ever having to calculate it. And like I said, this is just a theory but I think it's a reasonable explanation of, of what could be going on in problems like re-arrest where um, people, um, they keep trying to apply more complicated models, but um, you don't, or black box models, but you don't actually need them. 
Okay, so um, back to the talk outline. So I've defined my, my condition, which is that um, when, you know, the simpler yet accurate models are likely to exist when the Rashomon ratio is large. And, um, and you don't need to calculate the Rashomon ratio. You can try just try lots of different machine learning methods, and that gives you a sense of whether simpler solutions exist. And now a lot of people don't believe me about this, or they're not interested, and that's fine. But sometimes it gets kind of silly. And so before I talk about the computationally efficient, before I talk about decision trees, um, I want to talk to you about a story that happened last year. Um, so I entered this challenge, um, this is this FICO explainable machine learning challenge. And the goal of the competition, this is the first challenge ever, by the way, about explainable machine learning. And so we thought, OK, let's give it a try. And the goal of the competition was to create a black box and explain it. And we got the data set. It was a nice big data set uh, designed by FICO, uh, fairly realistic looking. And, but just at a glance, it looked like it had a good data representation. And I thought, could I be wrong? Could it be you know, a problem with a good data representation where you need a black box? <laughs> so I said to my students, well, I don't know about this data set. I don't know about this competition. You know, just try running a bunch of algorithms on the data set and see whether they all perform the same. And so a day or two later, they came back and um, they said, yep, they all perform the same. And so we knew at that point that we could construct an interpretable model. Um, and so, you know, we had a debate. <laughs> we said, should we send in an interpretable model with the same level of accuracy, you know, which the judges probably wouldn't know how to deal with because they, they told us create a black box and explain it. So, um, or should we, you know, just follow the, follow the directions? And so we decided, like after a very small amount of debating, we decided that for a problem as important as credit risk, we should create an interpretable model. So we did, we created a globally interpretable model with beautiful, with the beautiful visualization tool. And it had the same accuracy as the best neural network that we could construct. And my students are pretty good at neural networks. So, um, you know, this, I, I trust that, that this was the best they could do. And they, they really tried. Anyway, it was very pretty, it was very colorful. And you could, you could press buttons to get pieces of the model to come up. So in the real version of this thing, which you can get at this website, you could click on these buttons and stuff comes up and it shows you the whole model and everything. And it all combines into an out output risk. And it's, it's like several, it's two layers of logistic regression, essentially. It's like sparse logistic regression. And then, yeah, you click on stuff and the models come up and, and so on. Um, and there were 10 subscales and uh, they were sparse logistic regression. And you could add up the points and see what you get. OK, so um, yeah, so we did this. Uh, and I was, you know, I was kind of proud of this. Um, and I was right in the, that the competition, that the judges had no idea how to judge it. And we bombed in the competition. We did terribly because the judges had no idea what, you know, what to do with this thing. And they also weren't expecting visualization tools. And so they didn't, weren't able to judge it and so on. But luckily the judges realized that their judging criteria wasn't great. And they actually saw value in what we did. So they gave us a special prize. <laughs> so they gave us, they gave us a, a, an extra a, a prize for going above and beyond expectations for the fully transparent global model and a user-friendly dashboard. And someday we'll get that $3,000. So I'm, I'm just kidding about that. But in any case, um, the, um, I was very proud of what we, did, what we did. And I was hoping that we could send our paper about this project to a special issue of a fancy journal. And so I was told to send an email to the, um, to the, uh, the guest editor of the special issue which I did, it's fancy, dear fancy esteemed professor, uh, we wrote this paper on blah. We don't know whether our paper fits into the scope of the special issue. It's not a traditional methodology paper. Its contribution is an analysis of the FICO data, including a machine learning model that's interpretable. And the paper's content won this thing. And so would you, would you please consider our work? And so um, the guy writes back to me, dear Cynthia, thanks for reaching out. This is an interesting paper, but I'm afraid it's not a good fit for the special issue. It's also related to my own recent work on explainability of neural nets. Is the FICO data still available? If so, could you share it? And I just, you know, I sent the guy a paper saying, you don't need a black box for this data set. And he sends me back an email saying, I don't care about your work, but could you send me the data so I can create a black box and explain it? And <laughs> 
that's this is unfortunately the state of where things are at the moment. And you know, I don't know if there's really anything I can do about this, but you know, at the very least, I figure I could at least try to create computationally efficient solutions to some of these hard op op optimization problems so that people, you know, at least have an alternative to the black boxes that they could use if they believe that trying one of these things is worthwhile. Okay, so um, yeah, so these are actually the, the four different areas that I work in, in in my lab right now. So decision trees, which I'll talk about shortly in the next, le next few minutes. And then I also have projects on matching for causal inference and sparse linear models with integer coefficients. These are scoring systems. And then interpretable deep neural networks. Um, but I won't talk about those three today. I'll just talk about decision trees. Okay, and um, I'm just showing you some of the application domains where we, uh, where we work. So I work in healthcare, criminal justice, um, and computer vision mostly right now. And I have a new project in material science. Okay, so I'm just gonna talk about work with uh, mainly Margot Seltzer, who's a long-term collaborator of mine, and she's a computer systems expert. And we have several students who've been working with us. Okay, so decision tree algorithms, they have been popular since the very beginning of machine learning. Um, but the main problem that's always plagued decision tree algorithms is their lack of optimality because they've always been these like myopic greedy algorithms like CART and C4.5, which construct these trees from the top downward. And so um, if you, um, you know, and they, they greedily prune the trees back afterward after constructing them. And so the problem is that if a greedy algorithm chooses the wrong split at the top of the tree, then there's no way to undo it. So these greedy algorithms produce suboptimal trees, but it's hard to improve over the greedy methods because decision tree optimization is hard, right? Both theoretically and practically, like there's a combinatorial explosion in the number of possible, possible trees that you could consider. And even careful approaches haven't been able to solve these problems efficiently. Like if you try to use mathematical programming solvers, it will produce you trees eventually, but that eventually might be several years from now, even for a relatively small data set. Um, neural networks also, this is not the kind of problem, like this is a discrete optimization problem. Neural networks are really not good for this type of problem. I know people have been trying to construct decision trees from neural networks, but no thank you. I'd rather use neural networks for where they work best, which is computer vision. Okay. So in the work we're doing, um, we're aiming to provide the first practical algorithms for producing optimal binary split decision trees. And we're minimizing uh, classification error, misclassification error, uh, regularized by the, um, the number of leaves in the tree. So here, this is just, um, yeah, mis this misclassification error. And then this is regularized by the number of leaves in the tree. So you can think of this as like L0 um, loss and kind of L0, zero one loss and L0 regularization, if you like to think about things that way. Um, and we don't use greedy splitting and pruning. Um, we actually um, use, uh, we developed a specialized branch and bound method to solve the problem that leverages computational caching. Okay, so um, this is an example, for instance, of an optimal decision tree on that Florida data that I showed you at the beginning of the talk. Okay, and this is a fully optimized on that data set. Okay, so our approach uses several important insights. And first, we have a collection of analytical bounds that reduce the size of the search space. And these bounds allow us to prove that certain partial trees can never be extended to form optimal full trees. Right, the bounds tell us that the leaves of optimal trees, you know, the leaves of optimal trees, they have to capture enough data um, to, um, to, if they don't capture enough data, there's no way you can extend the tree to become a full optimal tree. And we also have um, bounds that force, that say that, so these are, these are bounds that um, prove that you can never optimize the objective I showed you on the previous slide if you don't have um, enough um, data in the leaf. And in fact, not only do you have to have enough data in the leaf, you have to have enough accuracy in the leaf. Um, the leaf has to, be, has to be accurate enough. 
And if they're not, you can eliminate not only that leaf, but all of its descendants. Um, also, if you have too many leaves in the tree, uh, or, the, or you have too many leaves for how accurate the tree is, we can prove that you'll never produce an optimal solution to the optimization problem on the previous slide. And we have techniques that allow us to compute things very, very quickly over the space of trees. So let me tell you about those. And one thing is that we represent a tree only by its leaves. We don't actually, once we, as we're constructing the tree, we don't need to keep all of the information about where the splits are, all we need to do is keep track of what the leaves are, right? So we keep this collection of leaves around, and then this is the representation of the tree that we're actually working with, not this one. And so this, this allows us to, um, to, to work with the trees much more conveniently because we can use bit vector operations and store all the bounds and intermediate results within, within each leaf. Okay. And we also, for, so for instance, we, we maintain a data structure that we call a permutation map that lets us figure out if we've already seen a different permutation of these leaves in a different tree. Because, you know, we, we could have produced the, the complete flip of this tree and we'd, we'd have seen it before, um, but unless we had this permutation map, we wouldn't know that, right? Um, so if we've already explored a tree and then we come across the same tree again, we won't explore it again. And then we also detect when we create a leaf that we've used before and we recompute the bound. We don't want to recompute the bounds for that leaf again. Okay, so yeah, so if we see this collection of leaves again, we know that we've handled it before, we're done. And if we haven't seen the collection of leaves before, we add it to the permutation map. Okay, and then the fact that we're working with these, um, th this leaf representation, uh, as I mentioned, it allows us to work with bit vectors. Um, and we store a bit vector indicating which data points have features that correspond to the features described in the leaf. So rain or construction traffic like that, that would be represented here. So which data points have those? Okay, and so that lets us use the bit vectors to compute the bounds. Okay, so um, yeah, so the bounds and bit vectors in each leaf, they also let us use incremental computation to um, to evaluate the children of each leaf. So if we decide to split it. So for instance, if we have the bound for the leaf, and this is the bit vector of the data points that fit into that, um, then when we go to kind of expand that leaf into ch to children, then we can leverage that information. We can actually help use the bound from this leaf, use that computation to help us with the bound for this leaf, and then also use the data points that fit into here, because the data that fit into here is a subset of the data that fit into here. So we can use the, the bit vector to help us compute these bounds very efficiently, leveraging this incremental computation. And then we also have to compute um, which data are captured here. And as I mentioned, it's a subset of the data here that are captured, um, then are captured there. And so we can use all the bit vectors are very, very helpful. Okay, so um, these features, these strong analytical bounds, the leaf-based representation, the permutation map, computational caching, and incremental computation, they really, they combine to make the implementation really, really fast, which lets us produce truly optimal and sparse decision trees. And we're getting like three orders of magnitude faster computation than when we started working on it, maybe five or six years ago. Okay, and our, our code is available um, on GitHub for that. Okay, so in summary, um, I've defined a condition under which a simple yet accurate model is likely to exist, which is that the Rashomon ratio is large like there's a large number of good models. And I showed a simple check for large Rashomon sets, which is to try to run a different whole bunch of different machine learning methods that produce models of different level of com levels of complexity and show that they all produce um, the same model, so not the same model, the same accuracy. <laughs> uh, I also introduced these Rashomon curves, which are these characteristic curves that happen to um, be present in every data set that we've ever looked at. And we um, and I showed uh, just some of our work on on the optimal decision trees. And that's it. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Cynthia. Uh, we have time for a few questions, and people can raise hand, or you can submit your question through chat if you like.
Oh, this is one question. Uh, okay. Some one question over chat. How do you estimate Rashomon ratio? I'm presuming it is some sort of approximation that involves sampling. Yes, it is. And um, yeah, I, <laughs> I skipped over that because it's complicated. Um, if you just use sampling, the problem is that um, for the small Rashomon ratios, you actually won't get any models that are in the Rashomon set when you sample. And so um, it can be really difficult to sample that way. So we use important sampling. Um, we start by using kind of an optimized solution. Um, or for instance, if we use if we want to use CART or if we want to use um, some of our optimal decision tree methods, you can start with an optimal tree. And then you can, you can sample around that tree and then reweight all the samples that you get by the, by the probability that you would have chosen them randomly. And so that's what we, um, that's what we do. So yeah, I skipped that because it's, it's actually not that easy to describe, but um, it, does give us a, it does give us a reasonable estimate of the Rashomon ratio in the cases that we were looking at, which were not huge data sets, but I think it would be much more challenging in really big data sets to actually compute these things. There's a follow-up question to that. I mean, same person. Is so there's a is there a variance? There is a variance involved there, and perhaps we should not read too much into empirical risk versus log Rashomon ratio. Well, all of the um, all of the uh, values that we have um, came from sampling uh, subsampling many times and averaging, and that's how we were able to get the Rashomon curves to be kind of smooth. Is because we would resample and average. And we actually have data sets where we actually couldn't get a good estimate on the Rashomon ratio because it was too small. And so in that case, we made the error bars like enormous. Like we would, we, we actually encompass the whole thing with a giant error bar. So I think uh, there are some cases where you can trust them in some cases you can't, but hopefully our variance calculations will accommodate, um, will accommodate that. I think Chirag has a question. Chirag, you can unmute yourself and ask the question. Uh, hi, Cynthia. Thanks for the talk. Uh, so I have this question. You talk about the uh, estimating the Rashomon set uh, in the empirical risk minimization setting. But I mean, in practice, you typically have some sort of regularization term. And so how would this regularization term actually skew the, uh, the, uh, the Rashomon set? And how would the estimation of the Rashomon set change in presence of this kind of a, a penalization or regularization? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. We had a lot of trouble getting our heads around the regularization. So the regularization actually puts you into a different function class. So do you remember I was talking about there's a hierarchy of function classes, you know, F1, F2, F3, like this. Um, so as you, as you add regularization, you actually move along that, uh, you know, you, if you add regularization, you move to more simple function classes. So it's actually changing your, the it's, it's actually changing where you are along the Rashomon curve. Because you're in a, you know, if you're in L1 regularized um, linear models, well, that's actually, you know, you can you can write that as a hard constraint. You can write that as optimizing over linear models such that L1 is less than five <laughs> or whatever it is. So you can always take the, the soft constraint and turn it into a hard constraint, and then that's actually a simpler function class because it's more constrained. Um, and so you have to, you have to, you can't think about regularization as, um, you can't, you, you have to think about it as actually changing your placement along the curve rather than um, thinking about a, a specific point with different values of regularization. You can't think about it like that. Um, does that make sense? I, I see. So, I mean, uh... Does that does that also mean that maybe one should start thinking in the dual formulation of the empirical risk minimization problem uh, for that function that for the feasible set to be uh, well defined in some sense? Um, I'm not sure exactly what you're asking, but um, but yes. So I think there's an old theorem from uh, the uh, the 1970s that says that whenever you have soft regularization, there's an equivalent hard regularization. Um, Formulation. So, so technically, every regularization parameter corresponds to a hard regularization uh, constraint, and so that might be an easier way to think about it than thinking about going to the dual and 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 um, you know going through Lagrange multipliers. I see. Thank you. Thanks. Sure. And Ben, Ben, I saw you had a question. Can I ask? Not anymore. It was the same as drugs. Okay, great. Joseph, uh, I see you have a question. 
Yes, thank you. So I wanted to ask you about the difference between using different models and different model classes for figuring out where you are on the Rashomon curve. Yeah, so each of those points is optimized over a function class. So it's the optimal value of the loss over a specific function class. So it's one model chosen from a function class that minimizes the loss over that function class. Um, th yeah, thank you for explaining that. I, so I noticed when you were, so your, your empirical results were over different, um, differently complicated decision trees, but then later on you were talking about neural networks versus decision trees versus linear models, or like different, um, different model classes. So I wanted to ask about that. Oh, um, let's see. I'm not sure exactly what you're asking, but let me see if I can, um, see if I can figure it out. So, so are you are you talking about the experiment that I was doing where we were looking at um, the Rashomon ratio on the decision trees versus the performance of the different methods? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah, that that experiment is a little complicated. Um, let me go back to it and see if I can explain it better. Okay, I'm gonna go right here, and then I'm going to. I just share my screen again. Okay, did that work? Oh, sure. Okay, do you see that? Do you see this? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so here, um, what we were doing was we, we had to we had to calculate the Rashomon the size of the Rashomon set somehow, right? We had to calculate the Rashomon ratio, and we couldn't do that using the class of functions we actually cared about, which is decision trees, SVM boosting, and forests, right? We so we we had to compute the Rashomon the size of the Rashomon set using decision trees of depth seven. So we assumed that if the decision trees of depth seven were good enough to approximate this actual big function class that we actually care about then um, we could try to correlate the size of the Rashomon set with the performance of all these different methods on the data set. Okay, so we were trying to, we were trying to figure out, does large Rashomon set correlate with similar performance of the different methods on the data set? but we couldn't measure the size of the Rashomon set in the class we actually cared about, which is like all of these different methods put together. And so that's why we were measuring the size of the Rashomon set using trees. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Sure. Okay, there's one last question we can take from, uh, no. yes. So, um, go on. Interesting. Uh, I have a question about, um, can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Uh, I have a question about the, the Rushman ratio. So when the class become more complicated, um, so that is exactly the place that the estimation of the Russian, uh, estimate become more difficult. So the variance is increasing. Yeah. So that is exactly the place that you want to make a decision that should I make my simple class more complicated or not? So how do you handle that challenge? Because as the class becoming more and more complicated, the estimate of the Russian ratio become less and less accurate because of the variance explodes. So how do, yes. you, how do you handle that? Luckily, you don't have to because all you have to do is run a whole bunch of different machine learning methods on your data set. And you can try to, you can try to figure out from there whether whether you're in a large Rashomon ratio setting or a small Rashomon ratio setting. You don't need to ever calculate the size of the Rashomon set. You don't need to ever calculate the Rashomon ratio. You just run a whole bunch of different machine learning methods. If, if, they, if they all perform differently, you probably need to add more complexity. If they all perform similarly, then you might be, then you might be um, better off going simpler to try to find that elbow. Okay, thank you. All right, I think 
Okay, I, I, okay, I, I land with my stupid question. I don't know if it's a great question, but uh, in one part you said it's about data, and uh, you are showing about those elbows uh, there, and this computer vision uh, data set like MeshNet and there's MNEST and the other data set from the stroke prediction and other predictions, uh, and and you said that there's no way we can increase the accuracy uh, whatsoever approach we use on these data. Uh, I. I mean, like, is there some reason why we can't increase the accuracy on those different kinds of data sets? Um, I think even if you had an infinite amount of data, you just wouldn't be able to do it. Why is I mean, that? So that seems very counterintuitive to someone from computer vision background. Uh, because because yeah. it's not like we keep throwing some data and things start improving and... Uh, I think it's, it, there's just an inherent level of noise in the data that just, you know, there's just nothing that you can really do to, to uh, you know, I mean, for instance, if you ask, uh, um, how well can I predict the weather next year at this time? Mm -hmm. Even if you had a ton of weather data up to right now, there's enough randomness in the system between now and next year that, um, you know, you see. can't predict it that well. <laughs> I see. So then, then if that's uh, that's the case, then let's say time series data that let's say we haven't gone that large scale in computer vision, but let's say if we want to use a big time series data, which is over uh, looking at say things over days or weeks or even years, uh, then I guess we would see the similar prediction uh, for the models in those kinds of vision data sets also. Maybe the things are working fine because ImageNet is a very static and a closed world data set where things are okay and you can, uh, there's not much changing, but if you go to say diverse videos with a lot of uh, motion or with a lot of background changes and all those things, uh, things might not be working well because, uh, because there's, all, there's a problem in the data itself. Am, am I making sense over here? Um. I, I think so. I mean, I, I'm not sure exactly what you're saying, but the, the reason that it works so well, neural networks work so well in computer vision is because there's like a low dimensional manifold that everything lives in. All the images live on a low dimensional manifold in this pixel space of high dimensional images. And so the neural networks create that, you know, they, they create a, a, a latent space where things are more Gaussian, right? They reduce you to sort of living on that manifold. Mm -hmm. And in these problems like stroke prediction, there is no manifold. The data is already Gaussian. This is already good data representation. So it, there's just not much more you can do. Okay. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, all right, all right. Yeah, is there think... any more question or should we conclude? Let me follow up on your, um, on your question actually. Yes. So uh, one thing that uh, you might then wonder about is, well, how do you define things like interpretability or simplicity, yeah. right, in computer vision? And so that's a bad problem, actually, because you can't use sparsity um, mm -hmm. like we did in decision trees. So that actually is a, a problem that um, a lot of people have been just starting to think about, and nobody really has a good solution. Nice. So, um, but these, these interpretability definitions manifest themselves as constraints. Nice. So you're still back to the the setting that I showed you at the beginning where you know, the unconstrained neural network versus neural network with interpretability constraints. Can you get the same, you know, can you get equally good solutions? And um, so far evidence, the evidence seems that even if you, even if you create pretty strenuous interpretability constraints on these neural networks for computer vision, you can still get the same accuracy. Mm -hmm. So as long as you define interpretability in a nice way, you don't lose any accuracy even there. Right. Yeah. Right, right, right. I see. Uh, all right. I think there are no more questions, so we should thank the speaker once again. Yay, thank you. Thank you uh, all for listening. Yeah. Thanks, Cynthia, for the amazing thank talk. You. Yeah. Thanks.
Okay, so I will talk to you.